from the Control of Communicable Disease Manual. This is a presentation on gonococcal infections. Gonococcal infections, also known as gonorrhea, sometimes goes by the clap, the strain, gleat, the dose, or just GC. Its causative agent is a bacteria called Neisseria gonorrhea. Uh, Neisseria is just the uh, family it belongs to. Gonorrhea is what designates it as a species. Like there's a lot of bacteria under the family Neisseria. Um, gonorrhea is just one particular species that can infect man. So the clinical features of Neisseria gonorrhea are gonococcal infections. It's a bacterial disease limited to the non-cornified uh, columnar and cuboidal, cuboidal epithelium, excuse me. It differs in males and females in coarse, severity, and ease of recognition. So what this means right here, limited to non-cornified columnar and uh, cuboidal epithelium, well, your epithelium is your outermost layer of skin. Cuboidal and uh, columnar uh, epithelium are found like in the lining of your digestive organs, the lining of your uterus, the lining of the vaginal canal, the lining of your, uh, uh, your urethra. So that's why you don't get um, a gonococcal infections like on your skin because your skin is actually cornified. Your skin, um, or sometimes cornified, will be referred to as keratinized. But on top of your skin, there's actually a dead layer of squamous cells on it. Well, your mucous membranes, like the the, uh, the lining of your lips, your pharynx, your mouth, like I said, your um, your urethra, well, that's made up of this non-cornified. It doesn't have that dead layer on top of it. The outermost layer is this columnar and cuboidal epithelium that it, that is still alive. And gonorrhea can only infect that kind of tissue. Moving on to clinical features, we're going to talk about the differences in presentation between males and females when they uh, experience a gonococcal infection. In males, usually there's an acute purulent discharge from the anterior urethra with dysuria within two to seven days after exposure. So an acute a sudden purulent pus, like a pus-like, really thick discharge from the anterior urethra, um, and then dysuria, painful urination. Um, so your urethra, like I said, is, is lined with that uh, columnar epithelium. That's where the gonococcal infection will set up. As a result, you're going to get that purulent discharge, that pus-like discharge, and that painful uh, urination due to some inflammation of the tissue. Uh, minority of males are asymptomatic. Uh, on the other hand, females. The infection is followed by development of mucopurulent uh, cervicitis, and it's often asymptomatic. So usually the infection is in the cervix. Um, some women have abnormal va vaginal discharge and vaginal bleeding after intercourse, but a small percent, 10 to 20 percent, there's also uterine invasion, right? Often this is timed with menstruation, and as a result, they can get endometriosis, uh, salpingitis, pelvic peritonitis, and subsequent risk of infertili infertility and ectopic pregnancy. So a quick orientation with the female anatomy here. This is the vaginal canal, right? This is the cervix. So the cervix is the entrance into the uterus, and most of the time, this is where a gonococcal infection is going to set up. This is where gonorrhea will be. Uh, sometimes Times with menstruation, it can make its way into the uterus. The uterus is lined with an endometrial tissue. That into endometrial tissue is what sloughs off a, a once a month when a woman goes through her menses or through her period. Well, inflammation of that, we call that endometriitis, right? So if uh, if a gonococcal infection sets up in the endometrial light layer, that's going to cause inflammation. It's going to cause endometriosis. If it tracks its way up further into the fallopian tube, well, then we're at risk of getting what's called salpingitis. Salpingitis is inflammation of the fallopian tube. So gonorrhea that makes its way up into the fallopian tube, that's going to cause salpingitis. And as a result, a lot of times salpingitis can lead to infertility or the risk of ectopic pregnancy. What will happen is when the ova, when the egg is released because of the inflammation, it won't make it its way all the way through the fallopian tube and then uh, if it gets in you know fertilized in here well that's what the definition of an ectopic pregnancy is is when a pregnant when an uh, ovum is fertilized anywhere outside this uterus here Continuing with clinical features. So uh, females and men who have sex with men, we also have to be have a high index of suspicion for pharyngeal and anal rectal infection. Those can also occur as well because it's the same type of tissue that lines the pharynx and the anal rectal uh, area as well. Uh, often those are asymptomatic. Anorectal infections can cause some pruritus, that's some itching, um, some tenesmus, and some discharge. Uh, conjunctivitis, we've got to worry about conjunctivitis, right? G getting into the lining of the eye uh, in newborns who are born to infected mothers. And if this is not treated, it can result in blindness, okay? So if this is not rapidly identified and treated, one of our big concerns with a newborn is blindness. 
all right, and then uh, very rarely septicemia, right, a, a, an infection throughout the body, 0.5 to 3% of untreated gonococcal infections can go into the joints, right, you can get arthritis, it can cause skin lesions, it can get into the heart, right, it can get into the endocardium of the heart, cause endocarditis, and it can get into your spinal cord, actually, and cause some meningitis, or into the lining of your spinal cord, that is. Diagnosis. So a couple ways we can go about diagnosing it. We can do the tired and true uh, gram stain of a discharge. So you collect a, a discharge on a on a slide and they're going to uh, stain it with what they call a gram stain. And what they will find that it is a gram negative intracellular, intracellular uh, diplococci. What that means is when they stain it, it the gram stain is actually like a bluish purple. So when they stain it, it's gram negative, meaning it does not take up the dye. So the dye will get washed off when they do what's called the counter stain, and the counter stain will stay, and it'll stay this red color. So whenever you see red like this, this right here is a you know after a gram stain. When it's red like this, it's gram negative. Where if it was violet, purple, or kind of a dark blue, that means it's gram positive, right? And then diplococci. Well, cocci means these sphere shape, right? These round and diplo. Well, that means two of them. So you, you usually see them in pairs. So these guys right here, dip, uh, these are gram-negative diplococci. They're probably gonococcal or uh, Neisseria gonorrhea. All right, we can also do a bacterial culture. They'll put a, a sample in a Petri dish. They'll incubate it and see what if it grows. And then most, more, more, more than likely, you're going to do the nucleic acid amplification test where they use a, a test to just to detect the DNA, right, the nucleic acid of that bacteria, and then it'll give you a positive or negative result. So moving on to occurrence here, um, it's worldwide, affects both men and women, especially sex, uh, sexually active adolescents and younger adults. Um, its prevalence is highest in communities of lower socioeconomic status. It uh, rapidly develops resistance to common antimicrobials, so that's something we've got to be worried about. Um, it's resistant to penicillin, tetracyclines, and quinolones. Uh, that's worldwide. It's widespread. Um, its incubation period ranges generally from 1 to 14 days. Moving on to prevention strategies, right? Pra safer sexual practices is always going to decrease the risk of uh, getting gonorrhea. Consistent and correct use of condoms with all partners not known to be infection free. Um, avoiding multiple sexual encounters or anonymous slash casual sex. Uh, mutual monogamy with a non-infected partner. So monogamy, right? Only one partner. You you are only having a you know one sexual partner, but you got to make sure that's mutual, right? If they're not practicing monogamy on the other end, that's not going to protect you from that gonococcal infection. All right, now we're going to talk about treatment. So treatment for gonococcal infections um, in the USA and Europe, the recommended treatment regimen for uncomplicated gonococcal infections of the cervix, the rectum, the urethra, is what we call dual, dual treatment. And we're going to accomplish that dual treatment with ceftriaxone, 250 milligrams intramuscularly. Uh, ceftriaxone also goes by the brand name or is marketed as the brand name Rosefin a lot of the times. Intramuscular, a lot of times we give this uh, medication in the glute, 250 milligrams plus uh, azithromycin, oral azithromycin, usually one gram. Like you see this little packet here, it's in a powder form. We'll mix it with some water, stir it around, have the patient drink it, put some more water in the cup and, and drink the rest of it. So we do ceftriaxone plus oral azithromycin, or if we don't want to do oral azithromycin for whatever reason, we can go ahead and give ceftriaxone 250 milligrams IM and oral doxycycline. Usually we do 100 milligrams twice a day for about seven days. Management of the patient. So patients got to refrain, refrain from sexual intercourse until antimicrobial therapy is completed. So they got to take their course of antibiotics before they resume sexual intercourse. Um, to avoid reinfection, they've got to abstain from sex with previous sexual partners until their partner has been treated. And that seems like common sense, but um, I've had plenty of patients return with a reinfection because they didn't get their partners treated. Uh, interview patients and notify sexual partners. If the uh, if the patient is resistant to notifying their partner, sometimes you can get a trained interview in there, interviewer that is, and they can uh, they can usually get the patient to uh, to notify their partner or uh, let them make the call to notify the partner. All right, sexual contacts of cases should be examined, tested, and treated if their sexual contact was within 60 days before the onset of symptoms. Okay, so if they uh, if they are 60 days before the onset of symptoms of your patient, that's somebody that needs to come in and get examined or, and you know possibly treated. 
and then all infants born to infected mothers, they're going to go ahead and give them antibiotics prophylactically just in case because they don't want to risk them getting it in the conjunctiva and uh, you know the subsequent blindness that can be a result of that. All right, time for a little bit of review. Uh, within how many days after gonococcal exposure do males typically experience acute purulent discharge and dysuria? How many days after gonococcal exposure do males typically experience symptoms? Well, in males, it typically happens two to seven days. And two to seven days. What is the causative agent for gonococcal infections? What is our causative agent? Well, our causative agent is Neisseria gonorrhea. Neisseria gonorrhea. Sexual contact should be evaluated, tested, and treated if they've had sexual contact within how many days of the onset of the patient's symptoms? Within how many days of the onset of symptoms should we go ahead and uh, get the sexual contacts in to be evaluated and treated? Well, if, they've, uh, if it's within 60 days, 60 days. What is the treatment regimen uh, that is recommended in the United States for gonococcal infections? What is the treatment regimen recommended for, uh, in the United States for gonococcal infections? Well, that's going to be ceftriaxone, 250 milligrams intramuscular, plus azithromycin, or doxycycline. So we can do ceftriaxone and azithromycin, or we can do ceftriaxone and oral doxycycline. And then one thing I wanted to kind of mention before we wrap this one up, uh, gonorrhea is a reportable disease. So there will be state requirements to, to report it, but there's also, um, you know, this common uh, instruction that falls on your bib is the Navy Marine Corps Public Health Technical Manual 6220.12, Medical Surveillance and Reporting. You'll find that gonorrhea is a reportable disease um, and then uh, if there's subsequent testing afterwards because of like resistance that's uh, you know that's going to require some reporting as well because like we said in the previous slide it is it is developing resistance to a lot of popular antimicrobials antibiotics so this is something that you know Navy Marine Corps Public Health Center wants to know about this is something the CDC wants to know about all right, so this wraps this one up. Like I said, this came from the communicable, uh, the Control of Communicable Disease Manual, 20th edition. Like always, I hope these are helping you out. Uh, go ahead and keep studying.